As an entrepreneur, you know it's important to get the right kind of information by going to the right people who are smart and have the content that you need. Hey, I found someone that I want to share with you. Had a chance to interview Mark Moss. He's a person that gives investment advice based on historical trends, based on what's going on in our world today. And he comes at it from a free market point of view, the idea of being able to live your life the way you want. He talks also about his recent move from California to Puerto Rico, some major implications for that that can help you as well, and where we're going. Plus, we looked at some extra technology of how he's using some really cool technology in his programs. So you want to join us for this special interview with Mark Moss here on Agorapreneurs. Welcome to Agorapreneurs, standing for liberty and freedom, all done peacefully. Now, here is your guide, Terry Brock. One of the most important parts of living life is living it your way freely and independently with liberty, freedom around you, and living it in the Agora lifestyle. The idea of living voluntarily and being able to live life peacefully. I love the way Leonard Reed said that long ago, anything that's peaceful. And today, you are in for a treat because I've got a person who really lives this life. He's doing it right now, and he helps many, many others, thousands and thousands of others around the world. His name is Mark Moss, and he's joining us for his, from his home there in Puerto Rico. Mark, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thanks so much, Terry. Pleasure to be here with you. It is wonderful to see you live and direct. First of all, I want to compliment you on your channel and what you do on that. You really help people in so many ways with it, have helped me a lot. And so I'd like to get a little bit, first of all, in your philosophical view of life, what you believe and how that relates to economics, the way that you help people with planning their lives, planning economics and financial um, uh, means that they're going to have. What is your overall view and philosophy of life? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> Where do we start? Uh... Well, overall philosophy of life, I mean, uh, I guess we could kind of talk about what you talked about with the Agora lifestyle. Um, so kind of this non-coercion principle where I just kind of like live and let live. Um, I would consider myself a free to maximalist. That means I want to be free to live the life I want. I also want you to be free to, be, to live the life you want. Uh, I primarily talk about financial topics. Uh, you might have heard the term financial freedom. But really, that financial freedom is what gives your entire life freedom. And so that's why I, I, I kind of focus on the money, um, not because you want to just pile up a big stacks of it for no reason, but because it's what gives us options to have that free life. So, for example, if you're broke, living paycheck to paycheck, you don't really have much freedom. You know, if your boss mistreats you, or you're in a dead end job, you don't have the freedom to leave that. Right. Um, and so really, if you can build up the, that financial base, um, you could quit that job, go, go, go learn a new skill. You could go find a new job. Uh, you could move to a different part of the world where you could execute that job, et cetera. And so um, building up that financial base of education is really, I think, that first fundamental piece to having that Agora, that freedom lifestyle you're talking about. Absolutely. I agree with you strongly on that. Matter of fact, I want to put an exclamation mark behind that. It hit me years ago. I'd see wonderful people that I knew I was at the time working with the Libertarian Party uh, in Georgia, where I was. And uh, I saw people said, now the way that we, the most important thing we can do is we need to get out and get so-and-so elected to the state house or elected commissioner. And I understand what they're saying and bless their hearts, as they say in Georgia, bless their hearts. They mean well, but I think that you can make a much bigger impact with what you've said, getting out there and get the resources, get the money. It seems like that's going to be far better than going the political route, at least from my point of view. What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah. Also, I believe in like, uh, I believe this future is decentralized. And so really it's about me changing my life, uh, changing those lives around me and trying to kind of build more of from the bottom up, as opposed to, as you said, people who might want to go join politics, as opposed to getting their own life in order and helping those around them, they want to go join politics to tell you how to build your life. And so it's definitely a different approach. Uh, lead by example, do what I say, not what I do, or I'm sorry, do what I do, what I do not what I say kind of a thing. So yeah, building that, building that uh, base so I can help myself, I can help those around me and we can scale it out that way. Yeah, I think that's most important. We're starting with what really matters in life. And I think a big part of that, something that you talk about extensively in your videos that I really appreciate, is the idea of having a good knowledge of economics, and particularly Austrian economics, and what that means, how it really comes in the real world. Tell us a little bit about, from a big picture, someone that might not know about that, what that is, and the importance of having that philosophical base grounded in sound economic ideas. Well, I mean, this might sound a little bit big, but... 
at the end of the day, everything in life comes down to economics. Yes. And so economics, uh, uh, everybody's life is affected by that because time is the most scarce asset that we have in, in the world. Um, time is the only asset that we can't get more of. So if I spent all my gold, spent all my dollars, lost my real estate, I could go uh, get that again. But time you can't get back. And so it has that scarce asset. And so really everything that we do is about that time, uh, trying to maximize our time, trying to buy more time in the future, uh, leverage other people's time. Uh, so there's that. And then, I, and then at, the end, at the other end of that would be that all economics, that time is built into energy. So really money is just stored energy that can be used at a later date. So uh, what do I mean by that? So for example, um, I eat food, which gives my body calories, which is energy for my body. I can then go expend that energy in some type of a work. Uh, maybe that's digging a hole, building a fence, building a website, whatever. I'm expending my energy. I get paid. I get compensated with money, which is my stored energy. If I've stored enough of that energy, then I can go use that in the future. So now I could go use some of that stored energy to hire you to fix my car, you know, mow my lawn, et cetera. And so money is all energy. And when I think when you take it down, you know, so the, the, the economist that we have today, you kind of referenced Austrian economics versus like a more Keynesian economics, the Keynesian yes. side of economics makes these things very complicated. And when it's very complicated, uh, you feel like you need them as experts to explain it to you and maybe even just stay hands off because I don't get it. But at the end of the day, really, it all boils down to kind of what we call like this first principles level. Um, and I just believe that if you can understand it at that basic level, then you can understand it at a higher level. And so I guess that's why I try to take these complex subjects, make them easy to understand, um, break it down to um, time-based economics, break it down to um, energy as money, kind of, a, kind of a thing like that. And I think when you understand it there, then it's easier on the higher level. Yeah, I think so. I mean, as we look at a higher level and what's going on right now, objectively, as we're recording this, the world seems to just have come off the charts in a way. I mean, it's just really or off the rails or whatever metaphor we want to use. It seems to be pretty crazy. And uh, where are we going? What do you see happening with the world and where we're going? Uh, maybe if I can get you to reach under the table there, get your crystal ball, rub it really well. And where do you see our world going the way in the track that the current leaders are taking us? Well, I think it's pretty obvious to anybody that's even paying half uh, half attention out there in this world today that this world is trending towards, we're moving towards this centralized uh, totalitarianism, like globalism type movement where uh, power continues to consolidate. So the internet has been taken over by a few oligarchs, right? Facebook or Google, uh, but the world is also moving towards that. So we see the world really being directed by these three-letter organizations like the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, the UN, the IMF, et cetera. So that's the direction that things are going. Um, but I think history tells us a different story. So if we look back through history, we can see that the world is constantly moving from these centralized models to a decentralized model. 500 years ago, we rejected the church uh, the church government and went to this more decentralized path towards God. 250 years ago, we left the monarchy of, of Europe and we started a decentralized government in the United States. And so here we are again, 250 years later in this kind of revolution cycle, we can see that the world is rejecting globalism, rejecting centralization. At the same time, we're peeking out at that. So I believe that the future tells us that we move into a decentralized world where these powers that these, you know, the IMF, UN, et cetera, that are calling for more power, calling for more control, calling for another, as they quote, as they said, Bretton Woods two moment, which is a new global yeah. monetary system. Um, while everyone's looking for that centralized answer, I believe it's a decentralized one coming. I'd have to agree with you that decentralized. So letting each person right down to the individual live his or her life the way that he or she wants, as long as you're not harming someone else. You don't initiate that force. And you have done that in a very practical way. Uh, as of this year, you were telling me that you made the move. You sat down, looked at it, moved from a place where you have been and still are to an extent, California, which is not known for its free market policies. And you've made the transition to Puerto Rico, which has okay. a lot more. Tell us a little bit about that and why. Yeah. So uh, as you said, you know, free market policy. So California is very restrictive when it comes to businesses. Um, they uh, make it very difficult to run a business. As a matter of fact, they've run most businesses out of California. So Hollywood's mostly left California. I believe California is now the fourth state in the, in the nation for movies. So Hollywood's gone. A lot of Silicon Valley is gone. 
Uh, Oracle was like one of the last big uh, Silicon Valley companies that left. Uh, Tesla left. And when Elon Musk said he was thinking about leaving, I think it was uh, one of the reps, I think Sanchez, she tweeted out like, F you, Elon. And he replied back on a tweet and said, message received. <laughs> and then we saw Nevada and Texas start competing for his business. And so, um, you know, we're seeing California and these draconian measures they're doing really driving people out, driving money out, driving rich people out, businesses, et cetera. Um, and that's part of the reason why I decided to leave. Um, again, right. Business was super hard. Um, taxes are super high, uh, not just super high, but they're almost double what the number two tax state is, uh, New York. In addition to that, during the pandemic, they were one of the strictest states in the nation on lockdowns. And so we are living there. Uh, we're paying, you know, this exorbitant amount of, uh, of taxes and just not getting anything back in return, you know, highest homelessness rate, um, one of the worst school systems. But at the same time, it was the most locked down state. The kids couldn't go to school. You couldn't go out to eat, et cetera, et cetera. So we decided, hey, why don't we go try somewhere else? Um, Puerto Rico looked like it was a pretty good option at that time. Um, much better business and tax structure, very friendly. They want businesses to come start here. Um, also, uh, at the time in January, um, this, it was more open. There was restaurants open, things like that. And so we figured, hey, let's go give that a shot. Um, and so here we are. Sounds good. Well, now that you're there uh, from being on the ground right now, how is it there as a um, like a weather reporter? We go, well, what's it like there, Mark? What's it like on the ground? Yeah, I would say that overall, um, lots of people warned me, oh, you won't like it in Puerto Rico. The services aren't good there. I would say those people are mostly wrong. I would say that... Uh, Puerto Rico is was much nicer than most people probably think it is. Um, it's very <laughs> Americanized, if you will, because it is obviously a territory of the United States. So, I mean, there's, you know, Walmart and Home Depot and, and Sam's Club and things like that all around. Uh, lots of American restaurants. The roads are nice. The infrastructure is nice. Uh, plenty of money, nice cars, things like that. Never felt unsafe at all. Um, it's a beautiful island in the Caribbean. So, of course, it's beautiful. Um, the beaches, the water is amazing. Um, so overall, I'd say it's been pretty good. Um, you know, depending on where you're coming from, there's a little bit of an adjustment. Probably the biggest adjustment to make is that on island time, everything slows down. So uh, I'm used to getting Amazon Prime uh, next day. And here, Amazon Prime is like two weeks. Uh, but other than that little adjustment, I'd say it's a pretty easy transfer. Yeah, you could probably handle that two-week delay there when you get that extra cash in your pocket rather than in the pockets of the folks in Sacramento. Seems like that would be a, a little bit nicer. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, like I said, the weather's awesome. It's, it's beautiful. The people have been great. Uh, the food's wonderful. Uh, so from that perspective, it's all really good. Um, you know, like I said, depending on where you're coming from, it might be a little bit of adjustment shock. But um, at the end of the day, yeah, once you get all the stuff that you need, waiting two weeks to uh, get something from Amazon isn't the end of the world. And like I said, we got Home Depot and Walmart and stuff like that almost on every corner. So not a big deal. Yeah, it sounds like wherever you go in life on the planet, you're going to find pros and cons anywhere yeah. you go. And I think the pros have to be stronger wherever you choose to live. And you've done that and done it very well. Now, one of the things I want to say for those of you that are watching this, you've got to see Mark's channel. Really good. He takes complicated economic ideas and puts them in language that mere mortals like us can understand. We understand it in English, looking at a historical perspective as well as economic. And so when I get someone, Mark, like you, who I get a chance to interview and talk to who's really, really smart and I admire a great deal. I want to find out where do you go for the intellectual well? What books are you reading? What podcasts or blogs do you visit? What has influenced your life and continues to influence your life intellectually? Yeah. Wow. That's a, such a big question. So I would say if I went back 25 years ago, uh, probably Think and Grow Rich and Rich Dad, Poor Dad were probably very two very instrumental books that kind of sent my life into a different direction. So if you're just starting out, those are two good ones. Um, as you go through life, you know, people ask me all the time, what's the, what's the best book to read? What book should I read? Um, I say, it depends. Like, what are you trying to learn? So um, I might be learning books about management. I might be learning books about goal setting, personal development. It might be about history, et cetera. So it just kind of depends. Um, the books that I've just kind of finished reading um, I was just at the blockchain conference, the Bitcoin conference, blockchain conference, rebel capitalist conference. And I was giving a talk there, right here in Orlando. Three, we got a chance to see you. Yep. Right where we met. And so, uh, I, I, I was talking about these three revolutionary cycles. And so some books that I read to do that were, uh, the sovereign individual, uh, zero hour, 
uh, the fourth turning, um, pendulum. So those are good books that were more on like socioeconomic things. Um, you, you, you mentioned Austrian economics. So, uh, I've been reading a lot of stuff from Rothbard, um, Hayek. So, uh, constitution of Liberty, uh, the road to serfdom is a, is a highly recommended book that I think everybody should read. Um, so it just depends, right? It depends on what kind of subjects I'm looking for, what I'm trying to dig into more at that time. Um, as far as uh, kind of keeping up on top of the finance stuff, the markets, that stuff moves really quickly. So books aren't really the best place to get that kind of information. So really podcasts, YouTube videos, newsletters, things like that are more where I'd get that kind of more timely, relevant information so I could kind of know what's going on in the world um, as it's going on, kind of like this play-by-play. Yeah, it makes sense. Right. Well, now the geek in me and the nerd that I am is going to uh, um, not uh, forgive me if I don't ask you a very important question. I love your podcast and the way you're doing it. But what is the technology that you're using when you have the screen there and you can move it aside and do that? What's the fancy schmancy stuff you're using that really looks good? Oh, the, the board, the whiteboard? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's a new board that I started using, I don't know, six months ago. Um, and it was actually my good friend, Ken McElroy. He makes real estate videos. He had it first. Um, he was nice enough to send me one. I said, I love that. I want to do it on my channel. So he sent me one. Um, and it's a Samsung flip monitor. And so basically it's uh, like a whiteboard kind of TV monitor where, yeah, you can pull images over, draw on top of them, play videos, things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. It definitely elevated my game. I know people love it. So they could thank Ken McElroy for that. Ken McElroy. Okay. Well, Ken, if you're watching this, thank you for showing us that because we really like it. And the way it is, the geek in me says, okay, I got to look into that. Think uh, uh, how we can work with that and uh, make, make it come together. Another thing that you do a lot that I really enjoy is you use a lot of historical references. Matter of yes. fact, one of the things you're doing right now is telling us about how we're seeing these cycles of political and sociological, economic and technological kind of coming together and changing. You've got a lot of good videos on that. And by the way, for those of you watching this, you want to watch this, go sit down, give yourself a a nice drink and something to eat and look at what Mark has to say about it. Really big. Mark, from the big picture, just kind of an executive summary. Tell us a little bit about those historical trends that you're seeing happen right now in those key areas. Yeah, I love history because I believe history kind of gives us that perspective that we need to understand both uh, how we got here, uh, what the heck is going on right now, but more importantly, even where we're going. And so while progress isn't really linear, it's more exponential, it really moves. However, we also repeat uh, cycles over and over and over. So we kind of have this progression of things changing, but the, the more they change, the more they stay the same kind of a thing. So it's like uh, they say history. I think Mark Twain said history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Um, but it actually does kind of repeat. So we look at it as like this, uh, it's reactionary. And so almost if we were playing uh, a game of bowling and we put the bumpers up and the ball would just kind of ping back and forth. And so things get so bad one way that they overreact and go back the other way. So in some of the studies that I've been doing, um, there's a couple of cycles that are pretty key. So one is like this 80 to 84 year um, populist uprising or regime change cycle. Three 84 year cycles equals a 252 year revolution. And so I kind of hinted to that a little bit earlier, but we're in this 250 year revolution cycle. So 250 years ago from today was the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the birth of democracy, things like that. And 250 years before that was the Protestant Reformation. And so both of those revolutions were, again, rejecting centralization, moving to decentralization. Um, and so that is where we're at right now. Um, and then we also have this 84 year um, regime change. So 84 years before today was, of course, uh, Mussolini and Hitler and FDR's New Deal, which was a fundamental shift to America as well. Uh, regime change, if you will. So we have those. Those are political, social, cultural cycles. And again, it really comes down to governments getting too, too big and too oppressive and the people revolting and then starting over. And then over time, the government gets too big and too oppressive revolution starts over. And so that's the political, social, cultural. Now, understanding that it's, it's a reactionary, that solutions come to problems. So if you understand what the problems are, centralization, globalization, manipulation, et cetera, then you would understand we need a solution to that problem. So that leads to what's called a technological revolution. Um, there's a 50 year innovation cycles. About every 50 years, we get a brand new technological revolution. This is different. It's not just a, a new technology, but it's a technological revolution. It's something that changes humanity. So, for example, in uh, when automobiles were introduced, people had walked 
for all of humankind uh, walked or horseback. And now there was a car that got rid of the buggy makers, right? Uh, electricity got rid of the candles, um, et cetera. So it's a way, it's something that changes life. So now we're in this 50 year uh, techno technological revolution cycle that's merging at the exact same time that we're going through this political, social, cultural cycle. So right as the world is leaving centralization, we have a brand new technology that gives us decentralization. The technology gives us exactly what society needs to make this transformation. And then the third and final cycle that I was really digging into was these financial cycles. And we have these like 80 year uh, credit cycles where the entire monetary system changes over, which is exactly where we're at right now. So we have uh, politically, socially, culturally, we're, we're ready for revolution, ready to leave centralization, decentralization. At the same time, we have a two, new technological revolution that gives us that technology of decentralization. And then the third cycle was this financial cycle. We're ready to reset. And we put all that together. It's happening right now as we're witnessing it uh, in real time. Yeah, we're seeing it happen right now. So, uh, folks, fasten your seatbelt. It's getting uh, rough out there. There's going to be some good. There's going to be some challenges, and that's kind of the way it's been on the planet. So, Mark, if you're looking, if you were to look into the camera there and you see the entrepreneurs that are watching this, let's say it's a 16, 17, 18 year old entrepreneur, or maybe someone a little bit older that's kind of starting again. What kind of skill sets would you recommend for them to acquire now? And particularly, what areas do you see there will be some real strong opportunities? given all of the macro influences that we see going on right now. Yeah. What I'd tell somebody is that as long as you have this device right here, a smartphone, mm -hmm. you, you have equality, you can learn anything. Nice. You can meet anyone, you can do anything. So it's right here. Um, as far as like what skills, what I would highly recommend to anybody, regardless of what age you're at or where you're at is a couple things. First off, change your mindset to understand that you get paid for the value that you provide to the world. So if your bank account's small, you're not providing enough value. So think about it in those terms. That's what entrepreneurs do. They give value first. Um, an employee wants to go, well, how much will I get paid for that? And an entrepreneur would say, I'm going to go provide that value. And then hopefully money will come back to me. So you could be the best brain surgeon in the world. And you're giving massive value to that one person that you're saving. It's massive value but it's one person. What if I could find a way to give massive value to a massive amount of people? I can make more money. So start to think in terms of those. Also, what I'd highly recommend is that you would learn what are called high, what I call high value skills. High value skills meaning ones that can pay you the most. What are those? What are the ones that are closest to the money supply? So typically those would be sales and marketing type jobs. So for example, if I went to you, Terry, and said, hey, Terry, um, I can bring you a million dollars of business in the next 12 months. If I do, would you, if I give you that million dollars of business, would you give me $100,000 back? Absolutely. And absolutely you would, right? So if I can bring that value to you, you're going to give that to me. Now, how would I be able to bring you a million dollars of business? It would be through either sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I would try to focus there. The technician role, you know, the coder, the programmer, the engineer, those are a dime a dozen these days. I can hire those anywhere in the world. Uh, but people that can affect my bottom line, bring me sales and marketing are always going to be valuable. So that could be anything from copywriting, uh, video editing, uh, social media, you know, Facebook ads, um, you know, high ticket closing over the phone, um, anything that could affect sales and marketing. And then third, I would look for something that takes all of that, but allows me to do it in a remote way. And so um, we're doing this right now. I'm in Puerto Rico. Um, I could be back in California. It wouldn't matter. I could be in Mexico right now. It wouldn't really matter. So find a way that you can take those high value skills and apply them from anywhere in the world. That allows you to have more freedom in your life um, to work in different jurisdictions, whether that may be to optimize for taxes, optimize for freedom, optimize for cost efficiency, et cetera. Um, so that's what I would highly recommend for anybody entrepreneurship today moving forward. Wow. And those of you that are watching this, you've just received the equivalent, I think, of a semester or a quarter of college okay. level learning. You can do that. What Mark just said, you're going to do well. Matter of fact, Mark, you actually reminded me on that of the best prof I had in my MBA program, Dr. Stanley. He would talk to us about helping others and going out there and going the extra mile, working hard to get that done and help them. By the way, he went on afterwards to do some other things after I left. His name was Tom Stanley, and he went on to write a series of books called The Millionaire Next Door. Oh, and wow. he really profoundly uh, helped me. And you're reminding me of him. Well, I guess that's not a bad comparison. I'll take it.
Yeah, he's a great guy. Well, now, another thing I want to do might be just a little bit different here is uh, I'm watching yours. You to have a sponsor that called BlockFi that is helping people. I have not looked at it uh, or I looked at it and I'm thinking, hey, this could be good for me as well. And I think a lot of our viewers would benefit from what BlockFi has. We're going to give them a little plug here. No charge to them at all. But I just think that would be kind to those watching as well as how about BlockFi. Tell us a little bit about what they have and how they can get up to $250 back from pl- taking their crypto and putting it over there. Yeah, so BlockFi is a way that you can unlock equity in your Bitcoin. So what happens is the way to build wealth is uh, the way that the really wealthy build wealth is they buy trophy assets and they never sell them. So they buy, you know, a uh, trophy property in, in downtown Manhattan, for example, and that property gets passed down through generations. They never sell that property. They never sell those trophy assets. Now, how can they own that asset without ever selling it? Um, well, they can unlock equity by taking loans against it. So if it was a piece of real estate property, you could do a cash out refi, for example. Uh, you could take out that cash refi, that, uh, that uh, cash advance refi, that money that comes out, that equity that I've unlocked is now tax-free because it's debt, all right? So that's how the rich use, uh, use these assets to build wealth. So we could do the same with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is also a very scarce asset. I think that we should be buying Bitcoin and never selling that. However, at some point, you may need to unlock that equity. So you put your money into Bitcoin and now I need to buy a car, I need to buy a house, whatever it may be. So what you can do Instead of selling that Bitcoin, which let's say that I needed, a, let's say that I needed a hundred thousand dollars to put down on a house, I'd have to sell maybe two hundred thousand dollars of Bitcoin to get the hundred thousand after taxes. So I'm selling two hundred thousand to get the hundred thousand. Uh, I had to pay the taxes and I lost the Bitcoin. So what I can do is I can unlock the equity by taking a loan against it. Now I only have to borrow a hundred thousand because it's tax free. It's debt. It's not income. But I also get to keep the Bitcoin for all the upside. That's the benefit of doing that. So uh, one company that that you can use to do that would be BlockFi. Um, Yes, you can earn up $250 in Bitcoin for using uh, my link, blockfi.com slash mark. Um, But basically you could put the, give them the Bitcoin. They could loan you money against that to buy that car, buy that real estate, et cetera. Um, If you don't need to do it, don't, don't use it. But I would much rather borrow against my Bitcoin than sell my Bitcoin. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense on that. And since uh, we're talking about Bitcoin, that was one of the things I wanted to end with here. You and I both believe strongly in Bitcoin. And for me, I look at it as uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. I'm largely in Bitcoin mostly. And there's other benefits. We won't get into all the details of that. But for Bitcoin itself, tell us kind of for those that are not there, they might have been concerned about it, why it looks good and how they can get started with Bitcoin. Well, what I would say is that if you can understand the problems that we have, right? And so solutions come to problems. So the problems that we have are the Fed prints unlimited amounts of money. The Fed doesn't have any transparency to tell us how much money they're printing. Um, the, the banking system we have today requires permission. You have to have permission to join it. So today, uh, half the adults in the world have no access to banking. So it's not inclusive. Uh, we have all these different banking systems and money systems all over the world. Um, I can't hold my wealth in a self-sovereign way. So the banks can always freeze it or seize it. If I want to send it to you, they could stop it. They could block it. They could prevent it. So those are the problems that we have in the world today. So we want a solution to that. So we want something that has a fixed supply. Nobody can artificially um, um, increase. We want something that has a rule of law that can't be changed. It has code that's immutable. We want something that's self-sovereign that allows me to hold my wealth that can't be taken. So that's censorship resistant. We need something that's uh, global, borderless, and permissionless where anybody can join it. So when you look at those problems that we have in the world today, understand the solutions that we need. I think it's pretty evident that out of the whatever 8,000 cryptocurrencies, there's really only one option that gives us all those features. Now, I don't think the world was calling out for let us supply chain management. I don't think that was a big problem. Uh, I don't think they were calling out for a faster form of money because Venmo and PayPal works pretty good. Uh, what they need, what the world needs is censorship resistant, immutable code, uh, fixed supply cap, permissionless, borderless, global, et cetera. And so anyway, that's what Bitcoin gives us. Uh, we're seeing massive benefits to people all over the world, specifically right now over the last week. Uh, in El Salvador, they've announced that it is now going to be a reserve currency for El Salvador. Yes. Um, there's the little town in El Salvador started using it as a reserve currency about two years ago called Bitcoin Beach. Since they've done that, it's been just just blowing up. It's been doing really, really well. Uh, so well, in fact, that it made it all the way to the government. And now they've decided to adopt that as a currency. 
Nice. I did not know about Bitcoin Beach. Thanks for saying that. That's a yeah. really impressive. They have done a lot there. Well, Mark, we really appreciate what you are doing, what you have done, and how you continue to help. If someone says, okay, I got to get in touch with this guy, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Yeah. So the two best, best places to keep up with me would be either one, just follow me on YouTube, just search Mark Moss. Uh, the other way is I'm pretty active on Twitter. So it's just uh, at the number one Mark Moss at one Mark Moss. Um, and so you can tweet at me, get at me there, DM me or whatever, um, or just follow me on YouTube. All right, Mark, thank you so much for what you do, the way you do it and the way you deliver the ideas of freedom and also give us some specific action steps that we can take. On behalf of all of those watching, thank you very much, Mark. Thanks so much, Terry. And for those of you watching this, follow up with this guy. He's really good. He's got some videos out there that I got a chance to see and thought, hey, this is really, really handy. This is the kind of thing that can help you to practically understand what's going on and then take practical steps to make it happen. I'm Terry Brock with Agorapreneurs. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much for joining us today here on Agorapreneurs. We're all about your freedom, liberty, and being the entrepreneur that you are, reaching out to achieve the goals that you want. Whether you're an entrepreneur on your own, or maybe operating within another enterprise or organization, whether you're a solopreneur or part of a much larger enterprise, we are here for you to help you get the skills and the technology, the right thinking of mind, right frame of mind, how to increase your connections, building those relationships in business that matter. Don't don't forget, we've got the 5K program, help you in creating content, no charge to you. You go over and you can look at that at terrybrock.com slash 5K, notice the K is lowercase, and you'll be able to get that information, no charge, and you'll also be able to sign up for the newsletter that we send out of the Agorapreneur's Power Report, so you stay right up to date on what's going on. And if you need to reach me, my email is the best way to get in touch with me, terry at terrybrock.com. Hey, thanks for being with me today. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.